Welcome to the Restitute Orbis channel. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to be exploring some of the mythical or legendary accounts across the land. We're oftentimes informed that the Native Americans were simply a hunter-gatherer society, and yet there's so many more details and so many more dimensions to the accounts of the Native Americans that we're going to consider in this exploration. They seem to be tied a little bit more closely to the land, and there are many more different origin accounts and legends that they possess through their oral traditions. Now, granted, as we explore these oral traditions, we're going to keep in mind that many may not have been transmitted to us directly. I would prefer to actually have a Native American account these lost tales of the old world to us directly, and that there's a demand we'll do that. But I think there's some wonderful details that we need to consider as we explore the lost tales of the old world. We begin by examining the account of the Setika, or the Sitika, there's many ways to pronounce it, a legendary group of people encountered by the Northern Paiute tribe, or the Northern Paiute people, who existed in Nevada, Northwest Nevada to be exact. I'm always intrigued when we look at these images, though, that are ostensibly taken from the 1800s, at least again, that's what we're informed of. What do they really communicate to us, though, about these people that existed during that time? There seem to be many unique traditions that are associated, and yet, how much of this actually reaches us to this day? There always seems to be some odd figure that's in the background that is watching over many of these images. And what's really going on with a lot of this background? How developed is this civilization that they actually took this picture in? It paints many different conflicting images and accounts that we have, and one of the reasons that the Seti Ka are intriguing. Yes, this is the Seti Ka. I've always wanted to say that. Giants. Red-headed giants, anywhere from 8 to 10 feet tall. But there's conflicting accounts, and of course, historians and scholars have looked at these oral traditions of the northern Paiute people and have screened them, saying that, well, perhaps they merely encountered some people who were only taller, perhaps 6 foot 9 or 6 foot 10, but certainly not 8 to 10 feet tall. And yet there are numerous other accounts from Native American oral traditions that indicate the encounter with giants. Now, to be honest, in my travels, I've never come across the bones of giants anywhere. And yet, I've also never come across the bones of dinosaurs. So, does that mean they don't exist either? I don't know. I leave it up for you to decide. But it's a very compelling account to imagining what these people may have been faced with. And if they did indeed encounter actual giants, 8 to 10 feet tall or perhaps much larger, what was exactly the nature of this encounter? And who were these giants? Who were these Seti Ka that they encountered, and what methods or techniques did they come from with their particular civilization? How great of a threat were they to the northern Paiute people? What sort of theories could we come up with to try to explain the presence of these incredible giants? Were they simply natural denizens of the land at that time in what we think of as northwest Nevada? Northwest Nevada is very interesting in and of itself as it has many unique anomalies with it along with these accounts that we have from the northern Paiute people. And indeed, we even have such accounts as places such as Pyramid Lake, named by the great explorer Charles Fremont, and Pyramid Lake named because it has pyramids in it. Is there truth behind these accounts of these giants that were encountered, and the threats that they may have posed to the northern Paiute people? And indeed, other giants encountered in the central highlands of Mexico, and by other Native American groups. Capturing and putting to death a giant. And why would they possess such a great threat? Well, could they have been some sort of remnant warrior that was brought about in the previous civilization? Or were they some sort of specialized hunter that was created through what we might think of as alchemical processes to hunt and terrorize the survivors of the last reset? And indeed, that seems to give us the impression of what's truly going on with many of the Native American oral traditions that they had a better connection with the land and the other creatures that inhabited the land. And indeed, that's something that we see that rings true with all the Native American peoples and tribes that still exist to this day. Although, we have conflicting accounts because mainstream study scholars, they try to go back and say that none of these accounts could be completely accurate. Perhaps it's simply exaggeration. It is oral tradition after all, and oral tradition is very easy to discredit because Oral tradition does admit that there are multiple accounts, because it's transmitted by somebody talking to another person, and 
Perhaps there could be something added to the message or subtracted from the message over time. Yet we look at the Lovelock Cave where this incident occurred in Nevada. Or Nevada, or Nevada if you're in Iowa. Many different ways to pronounce the same word, which is always rather enjoyable. But you consider this very climactic account in this final decisive confrontation between the Northern Paiute and the Setika, or the Setike. And we look at other images, which of course we're told were debunked, and indeed many scholars have looked at this cave and this encounter, and they have certainly put their efforts into debunking the very existence of these giants. Of course, we don't know exactly when this encounter occurred, given our current chronological calendar, but we do have some idea that there are fossils and remains in these caves, but of course seeing them and actually analyzing them doesn't really give us any more answers. Is it possible that the Northern Paiute encountered these giants? It's very possible. Now, could it also be possible that they simply encountered a wandering band of strange people who had red hair and were on the higher range of six feet tall? That's possible as well. But I believe that there's a little bit more of accuracy and validity to this particular account because when you have oral tradition, it's climactic events, memorable events that tend to be remembered and transmitted on the oral tradition. And even with the variances in the different accounts that you have with the encounter of the Seti Ka, there's other tribes and other peoples across North America and other lands as well who've encountered giants. And yet it's always dismissed, it's always derided. Considering sacred sites across the land as well by various peoples and tribes and nations, it's also intriguing to me that we oftentimes look past Salton Lake which is in Southern California. Salton Lake has many different accounts associated with it. Some even say that it could be a gateway, a portal to other lands, and others say that the Native Americans had many different accounts with it, stating that it could have been a path to darkness. Also, the origin accounts of these lands in Southern California are very intriguing, and whether we're talking about the Colorado Desert, the Mojave Desert, or the Sonoran Desert, or any of the other deserts in Southwest United States. There's always something interesting associated with them. This Salton Sea or Salton Lake or all the other names that it's had always seems to have had an interesting history of development with it. Indeed, in the 20th century or the 1900s, the United States and the state of California attempted to develop this area. And it did not succeed for a variety of reasons that you can look up on your own. Because it seems as though, once again, there's even conflicting accounts as soon as just a few decades ago. For whatever reason, the area is now mostly uninhabited and there's all kinds of accounts of strange encounters. We also look at some of the brilliant landmarks in the southwestern desert, and whether we're driving through Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, or any of the other areas within the four-state, four-corner area where the ancestral Puebloans inhabited, although how real are the ancestral Puebloans? Did they really exist as the mainstream tells us they did? Are they connected with the actual oral traditions of the Native American nations and tribes that inhabited the area? It's subject to much debate. And you'll even come across great craters, such as THE Great Crater. But what really caused it? Is it really from some meteorite or asteroid impact as we might be expected to believe? And even the mountains, the Tetons, as you go into Wyoming. Going all across the land, you have these very interesting landmarks that seem to give the clue that there's something much more dramatic that was going on in this western area of the United States. And many people and defenders of the mainstream narrative will simply try to tell us that the Native Americans are proof that there was no civilization that existed prior to our civilization. And yet the same mainstream will tell us that, well, actually the Native Americans did have great civilizations of their own. And some of them even built pyramids. It just depends on what latitude you're at, whether you call them pyramids or whether you call them mounds. Such as the interesting account behind Mount Rushmore, which we explored. Are we talking about kings? Are we talking about Vikings? Are we talking about six grandfathers? We've explored it in detail before, but... One thing I always found intriguing about the Black Hills area of South Dakota where Mount Rushmore is situated is the fact that all Native Americans in that area consider it a very holy and respected place. And as they said in the film Dances of Wolves, even our enemies agree that this is a special place. And if you examine the terrain anywhere around the Black Hills or what is today called Custer National Park, you'll see that. 
There are scenes of immense serene beauty that one could lose oneself in. And it's very easy to understand exactly how and why the people that we affiliate with the Native Americans, whether it's the Sioux or any one of the numerous tribes, do have a closer connection. And let's look at the account of the Hopi of the Fifth World. The Hopi, one of the descended tribes or nations from the ancestral Puebloans. What I find intriguing though about the accounts of the Hopi is some of the Puebloans or the Pueblo ruins that are still present in the southwest United States. And whether we're in southwest Colorado or anywhere else, you'll see that there's some very dramatic ruins there that give you the impression of settlements that were very well constructed and planned out. And oftentimes you'll have the remnants of infrastructure that we tend to associate with older civilizations. Could this have been some sort of reset compound of its own? A place where the people attempted to survive? The Hopi are perhaps most interesting in terms of their account of the reset because they do have an oral tradition that relates that we are currently in what they consider the fourth world, or at least the fourth era to them. And yes, this is one of the accounts that actually inspired the concept of the five eras on this channel. And I think there's a lot of details that do reach us through the Hopi oral traditions. And it should be noted that one of the reasons why I personally hold such a high respect for Native American nations and tribes is because of the fact that they have retained this very close connection that they have. One to their own personal history, the true account of what happened, but also their understanding of achieving a balance with the land, the resources provided by the land, the other creatures that dwelled upon the land. That's something that I think is always respectable. When you actually look into the artwork of the Hopi though, you'll find some very interesting representations. Now, were these just the people who didn't have an understanding of their land? The oral traditions and what we see, it seems that they had a great understanding of what was really happening. And the fact that they do relate to us of what happened in the distant past, with worlds that fell out of balance, with peoples who indulged in evil practices. And this is what ultimately caused what they would consider a reset in what they termed the previous worlds. Now, once again, I'm just giving a generalized summary of these oral traditions. I think the best way to really share these oral traditions would be to actually have a member of one of these nations or tribes relay them on a video. And if there's a demand for that, I may consider it. As it may be, I do have the means of actually having some individuals relay their oral traditions. Now, are there oral traditions that they will not share? Absolutely. And can we really be surprised that there are many things that they don't share with others. Not at all. Because in many of the mentalities, it's because of the fact that knowledge has to be earned. You simply can't bestow it on people. You simply can't share something and have it repeated. And we certainly see examples of that in our current society, in our current civilization. That we simply repeat an account that's given to us, we apply no critical thinking or thought to it, and suddenly it becomes the truth. And it becomes the incontrovertible truth. And yet when you look across the land and you consider these many different wondrous accounts that the Native American nations had, their oral traditions seem to reflect many dimensions that were once really present on the land. And indeed, I've always given a lot more veracity to what they've shared with the origin story, especially with how the land came to, came to be. One area that's always intrigued me is the Mojave Desert, and especially the area around what we call Death Valley to this day. How exactly was the land scarred in the way that it was? What's the true account of what really happened? Was there some sort of comet or meteorite that actually hit the area and destroyed the land? And what about the ant people? Yes, the ant people who helped the Hopi. It's even stated that they saved them twice from destruction, taking them to the underground, in great underground cities. And once again, we have another account of a more advanced people with greater cities. And who were these ant people? There's many different theories. Some state that they were extraterrestrials. Others state that they are simply more advanced civilizations that live in the crust of the very earth itself, or whatever you want to think of it as. There's many conflicting views in who and what the ant people could have been. But the fact that there is this spiritual resonance that you see that still endures with these oral traditions today, and the simple fact that they're still remembered and recounted, we can see how the Hopi were dispersed across the current state of Arizona and where their reservations were. 
The reservations, a definite sign that the Native Americans endured a reset, a reset that was imposed by another power. That was just simply the way that they endured it. And then, of course, the American education system, which is all part of the conflict assimilation indoctrination concept or process that seemed to be used on everyone across the land after the last reset. And yet, for whatever reason, the Native Americans, whether it's the Hopi, the Navajo, the Lakota, or any of the other tribes or nations, managed to retain their connections with their past. And they've also managed to retain a very deep connection with the land. And that's one of the main reasons why I believe that they have a more accurate account of what may have transpired in the past. Now, is there, are there other details that we still may be searching out? Are there other dramatic examples of what could have happened? Absolutely. But, again, you simply can't repeat something. You simply can't share something. Knowledge has to be struggled for in many ways, shapes, and forms. And it takes experience. For example looking at this incredible area. The Anasazi Ruin in Mesa Verde, southwestern Colorado, a very impressive city that seems to have been built in the very rock itself. Many intriguing realities exist, though, about these particular sites in terms of how they're actually hidden within the land, and they even seem to be hidden from aerial observation. Quite an interesting consideration if we're to take the past chronology that we're given from the mainstream at face value. Many of these wondrous terrain features, though, that these cities were hidden in still exist to this day. And we have to reevaluate exactly what we see in terms of the Native Americans. These weren't just a hunter-gatherer culture that simply roved the land as nomads. These were people that were very much in touch with their society, their culture, and their land and the fact that they built incredible cities like this within the land itself. And we have to also evaluate what it means that they seem to have been concealed from aerial observation, because that's one of the realities that's often faced. It's an observation that's called out with many of these older settlements that still endure to this day. How exactly did they build them, and what resources did they really have? And when we look at the ruins of these cities, and amazed at how well they're holding out, we also consider how we might think of this area as being very underpopulated currently, but was that always the case? And indeed, what actual details occurred within this particular land, these four corners of these states, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, and then even going beyond the four states to the west to Nevada. It's very intriguing when we consider these accounts and this impressive land. We consider the fact that these wondrous cities were once built by these people, seemingly hidden by aerial observation. Was there some sort of threat, some sort of threat that could have come from the air? It's one of the things that when you look at how a city could have defended itself, we oftentimes look at the cities in Europe, and we've talked about the great star fort fortifications, at least that's what we're informed about them, and indeed they even came across the United States during the United States Civil War. But these fortifications were not very effective. We consider the Cliff Palace and how it was actually constructed in Mesa Verde, and yet we see signs of similar construction. We see an industrious people who were creative and managed to actually build a very geometrically impressive city, and yet also conceal it within the very land itself. And whatever the adversary or threat that they were facing at that time, it was quite ingenious. And if you have the means, and you're anywhere near Mesa Verde, Colorado, I certainly recommend visiting these sites because there's nothing like an on-site exploration. The very impressive and geometrically precise Pueblo Bonito laid out in northern Mexico or northern New Mexico by the ancestral Puebloans as they are called. Again, what's the true history behind these peoples and how exactly do they relate to the current nations and tribes? Do their oral traditions actually indicate that these great civilizations existed or do they have a different account of them? That's something I certainly encourage you all to research and come to your own conclusions on, because it's very difficult to determine. And also remember the fact that if you go to further latitudes in the south, you'll come across actual pyramids. Mexico is really not that far away from New Mexico, and it's really not that far away from the United States, where we'll be assured that there were no pyramids built by the civilizations at that time. But whether we're talking about the Aztec, the Mayan, or the Incan, 
we always have signs that there may have been much more that was occurring in the past. When we look at northern New Mexico, we see one of the most dramatic remains of an area called Shiprock. Shiprock with a very unique rock formation that, oddly enough, seems to have walls coming off from it, going in multiple directions. Of course, the mainstream tells us that this is merely the result of volcanic activity and a series of natural geological activity over the years. And yet the Navajo have quite the interesting origin story. And now let's go to St. Louis to look at the Mississippian culture. Yes, there were actual mounds in the city of St. Louis, although some people have tried to tell me that there were only mounds in Cahokia across the river in Illinois. But these mounds did actually exist in the city of St. Louis. And the mainstream and the official history of the city indicates that these mounds were removed. And these actual mounds that you could say resemble certain structures, you know, we've been over it many times, were removed because they needed to make way for building the city of St. Louis. So once again, we have another account of a massive excavation project that had to be undertaken during a time when there was limited to virtually no heavy machinery, and yet once again, working very, very hard and diligently and having plenty of time to pose for pictures, the people of St. Louis in the 1800s had the time to remove these mounds. Indeed, there was supposedly an ironclad, and yes, I'm going to use that term directly, in the United States Civil War, named the USS Mound City after this area of mounds. And fortunately, somebody had the foresight to take pictures of these mounds before they were removed from St. Louis. Even an account saying that the mounds were removed to facilitate having the World's Fair. And now we're actually looking at the mound in Cahokia in Illinois, just to make it very clear for some people who try to claim that there were mounds that were only in Cahokia. Yes, this is the great mound in Cahokia. What was this really, though? Is this the remnant of something much more dramatic and a sign of something beyond natural terrain? Well, even the mainstream tells us that this is not just a hill, this is actually a mound and that this was artificially constructed. But what's the truth of the reality behind this particular picture? What, in fact, is the truth behind these Mississippian cultures, as they called them? Now, these were ancient Native Americans, as they like to say, that lived in this particular area of the United States, centered around the Mississippi, although they seemed to spread out quite a bit, didn't they? And you might recall, in the distant past of the channel, we did explore a site called Aztalan in Wisconsin. We'll take a look at that again, because that is connected with these Mississippian cultures. And something else I'll ask you to consider is, do the oral traditions of the current Native Americans actually reflect the reality of these Mississippian cultures? Or is this merely a mainstream interpretation from the current universities and scholars of the United States? And yes, I'm well aware that there are many Native Americans who have taken part in these studies, and I'm not saying or questioning their legitimacy. I'm merely saying that we need to apply critical thinking and ensure that what we're looking at is the actual account. Because what's intriguing to me about this Mississippian culture is just how advanced it's shown as being in a lot of this artwork. But how accurate is it? In other words, could it have been much more advanced? Could they have actually been the very cities that are still sitting there? Or is there some other explanation? Could it also be that what they're really referring to are the remnants of the civilization from the third era before the reset to the fourth era? Or could it have simply been the surviving enclaves from the fourth era to our current era? Again, we're referring to the channel's five eras theory. But you can see how it ties wonderfully into the other accounts, oral traditions, that came from any number of Native American nations or tribes. Indeed, we look at how the Spanish explored the United States, according to the mainstream account, and what they may have come across. And oftentimes, what we're told is that the early explorers gave us the details of these Mississippian cultured peoples, or whatever you want to call them, because they seem to have different names. Oddly enough, whatever, whatever group of people we're talking about, they left wondrous artwork and many different examples. We're also informed by those original European explorers, again, according to the mainstream, that these cultures were actually into human sacrifice much like the Aztecs. And the reason we're stated is that because they believe they were living in the final era. And the only thing that was going to keep the last son from dying out was by engaging in human sacrifice. Although, how much truth is there to this account? And remember who this count came from, because we might want to recall that according to the mainstream history, 
the Spanish did impose this little economic system called encomienda. Encomienda, which was not exactly kind to the survival of many of the individuals from the civilizations that once flourished in these lands. Now, is this exactly what happened? Well, that's what the mainstream tells us. Or are there more details behind it? Is there something else occurring that we may not be aware of? Is there a reason that there is such an effort made to convince us that this Mississippian culture existed the way that it did? Is it simply trying to direct our focus somewhere else? There's no doubt that there's many mounds across the land, and no doubt that they seem to reflect a great understanding of engineering and geometric precision, and they certainly took a lot of work to achieve. And, of course, we're not going to call them pyramids because they're not pyramids, they are mounds. But yet, whenever you look at the examples of the artwork and you understand exactly what it really reflects, you have to ask, is this something that this actual people did? Or were these merely remnants and artifacts that were found later that were attributed to a different group of people? How could anybody or everybody get it exactly right, is all I'm asking. Because it's amazing to me how confident we are and how oftentimes we like to hand wave, categorize, and label many groups of people. And we still do that to this day. And it certainly doesn't have to be an ancient people or civilization that we're not aware of. But yet we seem to, be ha we seem to have this perception that this great culture, this great civilization was capable of achieving these mounds and they had a great understanding of the land and yet they always want to tell us that they seem to have a darker side while at the same time ignoring our own darker side. Going back to the Aztalan site in Wisconsin near Lake Mills in Wisconsin just south of I-94 between Madison and Milwaukee, I'm reminded of those sites that I saw there. And over a year ago I walked them and actually explored them. And if you have any sort of site with mounds like this anywhere close to where you may be located in the land, I strongly suggest walking it and looking at it on site. The reason I started with Google Earth, and this was actually one of the original explorations that turned me away from using Google Earth, because there were a lot of details that you just don't see. But when you actually get on the ground, you'll see what a mound looks like and what a pyramid actually looks like. And remember that we define certain things as mounds, especially anything in the United States, and the only pyramids in North America are to be found in what is today Mexico. Is there something more to this account, or once again, is it just a hand wave explanation? Are we being intentionally confused, or is the mainstream not fully understanding exactly what happened in the past? Is there something that's attempting to be hidden, or is it just simply confusion and misunderstanding? Not necessarily any sort of purposeful intention to mislead, but simply not being aware of what actually happened. I'm always amazed when you just consider that, when you compare any mound to any of the bona fide pyramids that we have down in Mexico. And oftentimes when we talk about pyramids, it tends to set off a lot of different things. For example, we sometimes seem to have issues when we want to talk about certain areas with pyramids. For example, in Sudan, nobody ever talks about the pyramids there, but there are many pyramids in Sudan. They're very beautiful. Going back to the Aztalan Mound, it's not a pyramid. It just looks like one. It just has steps and levels to it, and somebody put a lot of effort into building it. But it was looking at images like these and then looking at Google Earth that convinced me that I needed to get on the ground out there. I really needed to take a closer look because I realized that what we were actually seeing might not be reflected even in these images and on Google Earth. And I know I was making quite an issue at that point, and one of the reasons I share this is just to recollect and understand how we've come as explorers over this time. How our perceptions have changed and really understanding what this is. What are these mounds in reality? Are they the remnants of structures from a distant civilization in the past? Or are they simply the remains of structures that the last civilization or the fourth era attempted to construct to survive the oncoming reset? The interesting thing when you look at the oral traditions of many of the Native Americans is that they seem to be well aware of events that were coming and were prepared for them accordingly. Now, is there something more behind that? Did they have some awareness through some means we didn't understand? Did their actual existence give them a prescient capability? Or did somebody come along and warn them? 
Well, it depends on which accounts you actually look at. Indeed, it seems as though these ant people, who assisted the Hopi in their survival, seem to have an awareness and understanding of what was happening. Why is it we see so many examples of observatories over time that are all across the land? Indeed, there were so many observatories that were informed or constructed during the 1800s. Was there something that they were really watching for in what we think of as the sky? And of course, we have our different divergences in terms of what the sky really is. But why was there such a focus on that? Could it possibly be related to the awareness that whoever these ant people really were had that they were able to use to assist the Hopi? Did they assist others? And could there have been a darker side to this account? Was it really a benevolent altruistic assistance that these ant people lended to the Hopi? Or did they have more malicious intentions in mind? The Hopi oral tradition seems to record that they were a benevolent people. But again, we always have to look at multiple different sides to everything and not discount anything. The Aztalan site interested me, though, in Wisconsin because looking at these old images, it did seem to convey that it was a step pyramid. And looking at some of the original sketches of the ground, it once again seemed to match many of the other things that we had seen over time. And now, doing well over a year of explorations, we can see that the map of the Aztalan ground shows many great structures and a very impressive layout. But why is it that we always have this mentality that this had to be a certain way? And how could anybody who lived hundreds of years after this all transpired know exactly what things were like in these particular societies, these towns, these mounds, what was really the intention behind them? In fact, when you actually go and you walk the grounds and you look at some of the historical markers there, they'll inform you that it was the early European stories or the early European explorers who regaled their stories behind what these people were like. Actually being on site, I remember being impressed at how everything was laid out. But I also noticed that there seemed to be an intention to communicate to us about what was really going on, as though we were supposed to have a particular perception. Because you might notice they put the palisades everywhere, and did those actually exist? Why would anybody bother with those? That almost looks like something that uh, gives you a little bit of a distant past, or maybe some perception that's not actually correct with what the people at that time used. And again, what are we really walking on here? These are the kind of things that we need to consider. Because when you look dead ahead at the mound, you can see that there's a lot of geometric precision to it. You can't simply try to hand wave it away and say it's a natural formation, although at this point in time I wouldn't be surprised if someone tried to do that. When you're actually on the grounds, you'll come across these little historical markers that'll tell you the appearance and manner of dress, and they do say it was from European explorers' descriptions. <laughs> and then they even give you an idea of the social organization. And once again, I'm just asking this question. Are these accounts actually from the Native American oral traditions? Or are they from subsequent scholarly and university-funded studies? It's just a question. I was always amazed, though, that when you look back at this particular mound, you definitely get that impression of many of those step pyramids that we see at the further southern latitudes in North America. And why is that? Is it just my mind playing tricks on me? Or do you see a completely different structure when you look in this particular direction? Do you get an idea that you really could be standing on something that was once immense and amazing? That even with the passage of time and even with the growth over it of the grass and the trees and everything else, you can get the idea that there is something beneath our feet that is very dramatic and something that we have many clues, many different accounts from the Native Americans' oral traditions that might tell us what was really happening. That might give us a better idea in terms of our true account of what actually happened. Now, as I always say, the mainstream could be correct, but with every exploration that I do, I find it less and less likely. But again, that's just me. I, of course, leave it to you to come to your own conclusions. Maybe you think that our chronology transpired to our current calendar exactly as we're informed. Maybe there's no signs of intervention here on this site. Perhaps this is what it was really like. But walking along the site and really seeing it and really connecting with it personally, I still think to this day that it doesn't match what we're told. Although there was one use that I had for Google Earth, and 
That was actually off the official site. There was a much greater mound between it and the town of Lake Mills in Wisconsin. And I really have to ask what exactly was going on at that greater mound. Is that really a piece of terrain that really looks like a mound from the ground? I decided to drive past it and look at it and notice that it did give an impression of a very large mound. Or could it have been some other structure? Well, we'll just classify it as just another monadnock. But what are your thoughts on all this? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.